Welcome to the Philos Project. My name is Luke Moon, and many of you might have seen this video by Tucker Carlson and a guy named Munther Itzak. And let me start off by first saying that Tucker Carlson is is pretty much a legend in the conservative movement. Um, you know, when he was on Fox, you know, my wife and I, you know, late at, would would watch him almost every night. Why? Because, you know, he was saying stuff that that a lot of people didn't say and seemed rather fearless. So, you know, I, I've followed him and then he left Fox and now he's, you know, over on, on X, formerly Twitter, whatever they call that these days. And I, you know, have not watched him that much, you know, watched the, a few of the opening episodes, but, you know, have not paid much attention seems to have gotten into, you know, UFOs and who killed JFK. Neither of those things I care about all that much. So to my surprise, Tucker invited this guy, Munther, on, on his show. And Munther is a pastor of a church in, in Bethlehem. So, so I'm here to do basically a reaction video of Tucker and Munther kind of having a conversation and I'm joining that conversation because Tucker and Munther are wrong. They're wrong on so many things. And so it wasn't just enough to have one, one single take where I'm like, Oh, look at what, what Munther got wrong or like what Tucker got wrong. No, I need the whole thing. And so buckle up. Cause this is going to be the, uh, the big deal is what we're doing. All right. So uh, a consistent but almost never noted theme of American foreign policy is that it is always the Christians who suffer. When there's a war abroad that the United States is funding, it is Christians who tend to die disproportionately. And this goes back a long way, 60 years really, to Vietnam, where Catholics in that country were massacred, but it's accelerated. So, for example, during the more than a decade the U.S. government spent occupying Iraq, the Christian, the ancient Christian community of Iraq was completely devastated. Nine out of ten of them are no longer there. They're gone. Um, that was an effect of our foreign policy, but it was almost never noted in the United States and almost never, ever even mentioned by Christian clergy in this country, many of whom supported that war and that occupation. So... We we didn't get very long into it before I have to say some stuff to Tucker because the Fields Project, we were started in 2014, largely as the ISIS was spreading across the region and the Christian population was being decimated, right? Like, it, it's, he's not wrong in that the U.S. invasion of Iraq in 2003 had a huge, significant impact on the Christians, but what he's missing is why, because the thing is, is that the Christians were always on the wrong side, right? Because they're not Muslim and therefore aren't part of that whole system. And they aren't seen as being, you know, people of power. And so no international communities really interested in them. And so they just kept getting on the wrong side of everything the whole time. And and he's not wrong. I mean, like in 1950, there were five million Christians in Iraq, and today in 2024, there's 125,000. That's a huge drop, right? And it's but it's not because like it's not because of the U.S. invasion. It's because of radical Islam, right? Like the yes, like obviously that you know it, the the invasion contributed to perhaps the rise of radical Islam, but there was already this whole, the whole story of Arab nationalism uh, was already falling apart, right? The, the party that Saddam Hussein was part of, the Ba'athist regime, was the secular Islamist nation national movement, right? So, which had actually a lot of Christians in it. Why? Because the other nationalist movements, Islamic nationalist movements, were, were they were not, interested in having Christians in their midst and the Christians didn't want to join either. Right. So the Baathists get outed, uh, get destroyed by the United States government said like Baathists can't be around anymore because that's what Saddam Hussein was. And 
so the so the, there was no really political affiliation available for the Christians who didn't want anything to do with Islamists. And that that doesn't get any better, right? So it's it it, it he, he's not wrong in that the Christians were decimated. He is wrong in why. And I would say that the church was fairly active in it, not as much as I wanted them to. Listen, I spent years trying to get Christians to be concerned about the Christians of of Iraq. And we we struggled here at the Felix Project for years to try and get Christians to care. But the problem is they don't really care about Christians anywhere else anyways, right? It's not like, you know, I mean, leave aside Iraq. You can go to Nigeria. You can go to you know, Vietnam. You can go to places all over the world where Christians are suffering under persecution. And the Christians in America are not really speaking out because it's not high on the list. It, it, is, it is the reality. It's terrible. I think, you know, a lot of Christians do not hear the, heed the words of Paul when Paul says, do good to all men, but first the household of faith, right? Like that's the Christians. Hey, step up for the Christians, but he's not. All right, let's continue. Why is that? Maybe because it wasn't, virtually no one in any American church said anything when Christians were killed in Syria, very often by Islamic extremists paid for by the United States but nobody said anything. And anyone who did was denounced as a kook or a bigot somehow. Standing up for Christians was not allowed in the US media. We saw that firsthand. And so once again, it continued in Ukraine where the US government has sent far more than $100 billion to the Ukrainian government. And what happened? What did that government do? Well, it banned an entire Christian denomination. The Zelensky government is busy throwing Orthodox priests and nuns in jail and having the army raid churches but again, not a word. But what about Gaza? All right, before he gets to Gaza, let me just also say two things about Syria. Syria, so the Christians in Syria mostly sided with, with the uh, Assad regime, right? So yeah, I mean, they're on, the, they're on the wrong side in a sense of the Islamists, but yeah, they died because of that. And, and he's also not wrong about the Ukrainians, uh, the, the situation for the, the, some of the Orthodox communities there. That's a real problem, and uh, I've spoken out about it, uh, and I know other Christians have spoken out about it too. It's 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 not right for sure. What about the entire region in the Middle East, where of course there's very intense fighting going on? Many Christian churches in the United States, particularly evangelical churches, support that, but there is virtually never a word about the Christians who live there, the ancient Christian community in Gaza, the West Bank, and Israel proper. So. Because no one has said a word, there has been great suffering among the Christian population uh, in that region. In October, a Greek Orthodox church in the Gaza Strip was hit by an airstrike. We're showing the video now. The church is in ruins. At least 17 people were killed that day. And again, that was hardly the first time that fighting in that region killed Christians. You'll remember the Church of the Nativity in Bethlehem almost 20 years ago, where a clergyman was killed in the church with American weapons and Christian clergy in our country said nothing. And you made All right. Tucker, seriously, dude. Um, all right. So so we're going to get into the whole Gaza church situation here in a minute because Monter brings it up. But the the Nativity Church, are you kidding me? Dude, those there was literally Islamists who fled to the Nativity Church, took it over with guns. Uh and and we're holding the church hostage. The, the clergy of the of the church were held hostage, and it, like they, all the the guys that were in there that were eventually they they found their way. Um, you know, they were they were negotiated, and they were exiled to, to cause some problems somewhere else in the world, <laughs> right? But it it listen, don't put this on America. Yeah, they were uh, they were American gun maybe. I mean, maybe there were those Israeli guns too. Who knows? But stop. That's, that's garbage. You're asking yourself, well, wait a second. If Christian leaders won't stand up for the lives of Christians, why have them in the first place? And that's probably a good question. So you would think that in Congress, there, where there are many self-professed Christians, somebody might be piping up on behalf of uh, their brethren in the Holy Land. But no. Just the opposite, in fact. For example, at a town hall event last month, Michigan Congressman Tim Wahlberg, a former evangelical pastor, 
said he would like to see the region treated like Hiroshima was treated. Watch this. We shouldn't be spending a dime on humanitarian aid. I really think it should be like Nakasagi and Hiroshima. Get over quick. The same, the same should be in Ukraine. Defeat Putin quick. Instead of 80% of our funding for Ukraine being used for humanitarian purposes, it should be 80%, 100% for life out Russian courses. If that's what we want to do. So to be clear, as a theological matter, Christianity is not the religion of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. It's the religion among all world religions that uniquely abhors mass killing. In fact, it, it is the religion that abhors mass killing. There's no excuse for that from a Christian perspective. And here we have a former pastor calling for it. But again, how are the Christians doing in that region? All right, I, w- I wasn't going to stop this one, but I, I can't help myself. You know what? This is reaction to anyways. So here we go. Here, here's the thing. Like, the way I interpret the, that that congressman's saying is he's saying, like, we can go with this slow or we can go with it fast. And one of the things that I think a lot of, a lot of you know, people looking at foreign policy, like, well, let's just kind of, let, let's let's try and keep both sides at parity, which is not a way that you continue anything other than having a war last a really long time. I mean, they, like Yemen's a perfect example of that. You know, either we either we side with the side we want, or we don't side at all. But either way, well, like when you when you pair up, when you give both sides enough to kind of go at each other, like it just takes forever. And not I'm not advocating for for Nagasaki Hiroshima type stuff, but I, he is not wrong in wanting to end a war quickly by using the means necessary to end it quickly. That's a that's that's a reasonable opinion to have, and I think it's what he's the case that guy's making. But yeah, I mean, obviously, you know, he's being hyperbolic. But you know, if you're spending majority of your effort on taking care of the and, and money and taking care of the people, it's it's it's, it's sometimes it's one or the other, and um, you know, it's 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 not an unreasonable position. That's all I'm saying region in Gaza, the West Bank, and in Israel proper. We almost never hear from them, and so we thought it would be interesting and maybe edifying to hear from one right now. The Reverend Munther Ishak is the pastor at the Evangelical Lutheran Christian Church in Bethlehem, and we're honored to have him join us. Uh, Father Ishak, thank you very much for coming on. Um, so let me just ask you a broad question to start. How? And before Tucker starts, I got to tell you guys a story, because I was with Monther. I've been with Monther a lot. He and I, you know, go, we go way back. You know, he got in a car accident a few years ago. You know, I, I, you know, sent him get well messages and all. You know, like, you know, we're that we're that kind. We're you know, frenemies maybe. Anyways, I was sitting uh, in in uh, Bethlehem Bible College where he's a he's a professor. Uh, it's probably twenty early twenty sixteen, and I'm with I'm with them. And we, I had a, a bunch of clergy from Africa who were with us. And one of the clergy is from uh, uh, Liberia, I think. And he's sitting across from Munther. And uh, he, you know, Munther makes a point about, you know, how the Jews are coming from, from Europe. And, and the pastor goes, well, where were they before that? And Monther's like, well, they're from they're from Europe. No, and the pastor's like, no, no, before that. And and Monther's like, well, from from Europe, you know, from from like the Caucasus. No, no, before that. And Monther had like, he he was like, well, duh, uh, yeah, well, it's it that didn't really matter, uh, you know. It was it was it was great. It was a great moment where such a simple question totally unraveled the. Uh, the plan because Jews are indigenous to this very land and that we're talking about here. So are Christians in the Holy land in the three places I mentioned, West bank, Israel proper and Gaza, how are they doing right now? Yeah. First, thank you for having me. Uh, These are very, very difficult times uh, and it's been difficult for quite some time now. Uh, when I say difficult times, I'm not just only referring to October 7th uh, 
and the fact that right now we are fragmented into, uh, as you explained, three territories, the West Bank, uh, Gaza, and uh, Israel proper, we can add to add East Jerusalem, which is a category in its own, uh, explain uh, one element of our situation, which is we're fragmented. Uh, so in my church, I have uh, family members with relatives in Gaza, and they cannot even visit before the war. They could not visit and be with them. Um, and uh, this fragmentation uh, is, as I said, one element of, of the situation. One of the biggest problems we're facing right now is the deterioration of our number. Uh, people keep leaving because uh, of the political reality. Uh, life under uh, a very harsh Israeli military occupation is difficult uh, to bear. And as a result, uh, many young Palestinian Christians continue to leave uh, for example, Bethlehem, uh, choosing to find a better and easier life uh, elsewhere. Uh, we are a small community, but we are part of the Palestinian people. And as such, anything that happens uh, to Palestinian happens, uh, happens to us. Uh, and uh, we are probably um, disproportionately affected by all of this because of our small numbers uh, as a religious community. Uh, anything that happens impacts us severely. Uh, case in point, what's happening in Gaza right now, where there are anything between eight to, to 900 uh, Palestinian Christians, uh, and uh, any impact on that community, any death uh, in that community will have a long-lasting uh, effect. So, Munter starts out here by bringing up the numbers of people who are in Gaza, right? So, it's estimated eight to 900 uh, Gazans, uh, Gazan Christians. Years ago, we actually tried to initiate a thing. We, we had a campaign, a fundraising campaign. We called the Gaza Exodus, which was literally to try and help get those Christians who wanted to leave out so they could go to the West Bank to the, like, you know, because a couple times a year, uh, they could, they could, they could leave. They have an excuse to leave. And that was Christmas or Easter. Because if they go at another time, the expectation is, oh, what if they're kind of leaking secrets to, you know, the occupiers or whatever, right? To, to Israel. And so the there's they're very, they're very afraid. They're an afraid people because I mean, you gotta imagine there's you know, two million plus Muslims. Uh in a very small area and 900 Christians. That's, that's a, that's not huge. Right. And it's, it's, it's a rough life. Um, and you know, they were getting by and, you know, some of them, you know, one of the things that we heard several times was well, they don't want to leave because as soon as they leave that, that someone's going to move into their house and then they'll lose it. And their house is worth like a million dollars. And so it was, you know, it's one of those things uh, that people were reluctant to do. And it also didn't help with the fact that several, like Munther and his crew, the other folks in, in Bethlehem, the other, you know, pastors in Bethlehem didn't want the Gazans Christians to move to the West Bank. And they actually, in, in several instances, thwarted our efforts uh, and spoke spread distrust about our intent and our intent was was to help the christians in gaza and so you know there's one example of many where it's not quite you know as you know cut and dry as one might think so what sort of support have you had from the christians in the u.s congress and just to frame this and of course people know this already but the united states government is paying for a lot of these military operations, and this is a majority Christian country. So um, have any members of Congress sent you aid of any kind, words of support, a fellow Christian? Um, we've always had a problem with American foreign policy when it comes to Palestine, Israel, and the Middle East in general. I've traveled to D.C. in December to advocate uh, for a ceasefire. I don't think war solves anything. And uh, no, I mean, uh, on the opposite, we continue to be horrified uh, by what we hear from Congress, with, of course, some exceptions. There are some uh, in the Democratic side, of course. Rashid 
So here, here a month or I mean, I saw all this uh, play out on social media. A month or was in in New York City or in Washington D.C. in in December. He went around with a bunch of progressive Christians and and they advocate for a ceasefire. But you know, we're talking uh, December, so it was right. Uh, it was it was right actually within a couple months of of October seventh. And mind you, I want you to listen as I'm playing this whole thing. One thing you never hear, one word that you never hear is the word Hamas. Not one time are you going to hear that word. In 43 minutes, not one time. Okay? And he's advocating over here for a ceasefire. Who's the ceasefire with? It's Hamas. Right? So it's he, he's not on the good side here. The, anybody who's advocating, any Christian who is advocating for ceasefire right now is advocating for Hamas. And Hamas needs to get destroyed. That's the bottom line. The clip uh, comes from a Palestinian heritage. But uh, when you look at the so-called religious right, we uh, receive no, no sympathy whatsoever. Uh, sometimes we just please to be, plead to be heard and to have our perspective taken uh, seriously. Uh, and one of the things I'm often struck with, whether when I speak to diplomats, uh, politicians, Congress staff, or even pastors and influential pastors, is how little they know about the reality on the ground. And uh, their knowledge of the uh, situation here seems to be very, very shallow, yet they hold very strong opinions. And oftentimes these opinions are shaped by uh, political parties' position. Uh, the United States position and not really based on, uh, 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 you know, an, a learned uh, uh, opinion that's based on facts, on being here, visiting, talking, investigating, and uh, knowing the facts. Um, and to me, the problem with all of that is it comes across with very strong opinions and decisions that impact our lives. Uh, many times I wish to tell not just the congressmen, but the pastors themselves who support them. Do you know that your lobbying, your positions, even your sermons have direct consequences uh, on our lives? Uh, Tucker, in this war, there was pastors who openly called, for example, to turn Gaza into a parking lot. Now, let's remember, there are not just, you know, the many, many innocent people, the majority of, you know, Gaza people, civilians, innocent children, but also there are our siblings in Christ. Uh, we have relatives and friends in Gaza, and here you have a pastor with influence uh, calling for the total destruction of Gaza. And, and you definitely, you know, you heard in the beginning the segment from Congressman uh, Wolberg, who is previously a pastor, went to prestigious uh, evangelical institutes, and it makes us wonder, you know, this obsession with love and, and uh, with war, I mean, this obsession with war and violence, it's the antithesis of everything that Jesus taught. And at the same time, it again makes us wonder, do you realize how damaging that is for us? So here, you know, I got some, I got some big issues with what Munzer is saying. I mean, obviously that, you know, anything that Congress does at any point always has significant impact on stuff on the ground. But, you know, it, here's here's one of the things that I I think it's really important for for everybody who's listening to me to think about. Like, and it's it's the it's the challenge that we're we're wrestling with as humans, right? Like, how do you deal with the death of the innocent, innocent women, innocent children caught up in all this sort of stuff? At the same time, there's not a single poll of Palestinians. Not a single one has come out since the war started where not where, where less than 75% of the people are supporting October 7th. Now, that's that's a terrible statistic. And I'm not gonna lie, that's that's really bad. And what it means is that the majority of the population, not just a little bit majority, but the vast majority, some of those polls are pushing 85, 87% coming out in support of October 7th and Hamas. And so when you're talking about the death of the innocent, like it, it really, that, that makes it wonder, like, is everybody that innocent if they're all supporting this? Because there's, there's a law in the United States that where if you see 
violent act or participate, even if you're not the one responsible, but you participate in it in some tangible way, you're complicit. It's the law of complicity. It's there. Look it up. Right? So not advocating, obviously, for the death of women and children. What I'm saying is it's a lot more complicated. And I I think it's important for people to think about this deeper. Right? It's all I'm, I'm, it's what I'm asking for. Just go deeper. That like don't get caught up in this uh, like the death of the innocent. It's it's much it's a it's a much more complicated um, uh, thing to wrestle with, and I think it's important that Christians do. And and I hope you turn in tune into the Fields Project because I think that's where the conversation, the the rigorous and profound conversation is taking place. Um, you know, we're not advocating. We don't want the death of any anybody who is who is. In, in harm's way, like in the, who, who shouldn't be. But at the same time, we got to be realistic that this is a, it's a war zone and it was started by Hamas on October 7th and, and Israel's pushing back. It's not intentionally, um, you know, killing innocent people. That's, that's not its intent here. And they're, they're, they're consistently been by outside observers with the exception of people like Amnesty International or something, have been have been shown to be pretty good at that stuff. So, Christians living not just in Palestine but in the Middle East, damaging in the sense of real impact on our lives, uh, but also damaging in terms of our credibility uh, in front of our peers here uh, in the Middle East. So we've always had a very serious problem when it comes to American foreign policy and uh, the religious right to support to that foreign policy when it comes to Palestine and Israel. So you have... I want to unpack just briefly a little bit more of what he's saying, because I, like, unless you hear it between the lines, you're not, you're not going to hear it. The thing is, like, the Christians are a minority in that region, and, and Munther is the spokesperson for the Palestinian cause. He, he, he gets some credibility. Otherwise, you're nothing. And so that he is very concerned about the survival of the Christians and worried about the Christians who are being, who are persecuted. So if they come out in support of Israel there, if there are Christians in, in the West bank who come out in support of Israel, they get treated really bad. They get attacked, they get abused, their families get attacked and abused. Uh, there's a lot of stories in that direction. Um, so he's worried about that. And that, and and if they're perceived as supporting the United States, and the United States is seen as being on the side of of Israel, then they're also going to turn on them, right? So it's a there. A lot of Christians are in a in a kind of catch twenty uh, two. But the problem here with Munther is that he has chosen to be basically the spokesperson, the Christian spokesperson for the Islamists of of the. Of the region not yeah that's what he is have people in the united states self-professed christians who are sending money to oppress christians in the middle east that's the sad irony of all of this is that a lot of the money uh, that comes from churches even before the war goes not just to the israeli military but to the building of settlements many of these settlements are built on land confiscated from Palestinians and in many cases from Palestinian Christian families. So I hope you understand again how. All right. So one of the things that always often comes out in these conversations is the, is the land confiscation argument, right? So let me give you some background. In the late 1800s, actually middle 1800s, uh, this whole area was under control of the Ottoman Empire. And the Ottoman Empire was really concerned about the plight of particularly the super poor farmers who just were squeaking by. They had almost nothing, right? And so they did basically a land reform act. And the land reform act uh, basically kind of made this rule. And it it kind of took the power, some of the power away from the super rich landholders who were sitting in Damascus or Beirut or like somewhere just in the Middle East, they're just chilling, right? And all these super poor people were just like eking it by, just barely getting by. And so they did this Land Reform Act and basically said that if you don't use the land 
within three years, like show that you're using it, like grazing or, or planting crops or planting trees or like you're, you're using the land. If you're not using land within three years, it becomes state land. And then the state has the ability to basically sell it, give it away, you know. So they had almost like a homesteading act, if you will, like we have in the United States where, you know, you can get a piece of land super cheap, but you got to do something with it, right? It's not just like sit on it. And so that land confiscation thing is there is, there is, you know, the, you, there's a lot of land that has gone unused and people claim it's theirs, but they have no deed. They have no proof it's theirs. All they are is like, oh, it's ours. And the, the, the thing was, is that that law, which was by the Ottomans, got affirmed by the British when the British were in charge. Uh, it got affirmed by the Jordanians. When the Jordanians were in charge of the West Bank, the reason it's called the West Bank is because Jordanians, West Bank of Jordan. And it was then affirmed by Israel when Israel took, uh, took over as well. And so that's, that's where we're at right now is that, you know, the, unless you like, and in some instances, there are several instances in which Palestinians were, have been able to show that not only that they, that they had the title deed back to the Ottoman period and they had been, it had been actively used in, you know, without a loss of three years that, that, that the, the Jewish settlement that was on that property, the houses that were on that property, they got torn down. It exists. And if you want to ask me later, I'll, I'll point them out to you. Okay. Uh, how difficult this is for us, because this is political and financial support from our siblings in Christ, rather than that support helping us or even helping humanitarian causes or peace causes or you know, initiatives to bring Palestinians and Israeli together. It's supporting initiatives that are causing our lives as a Christian community more and more difficult and causing many of us to leave because it seems that there is no future for us uh, in this land. Uh so one of the things that I want you to check out, uh, the Fields Project back in 2020 uh, did a survey, actually the first of its kind of Palestinian Christians and the reason why they're leaving uh, Bethlehem and this, all, all of the Christian towns. And it's largely economic. Um, and that was what they admitted. Uh, they wanted more economic freedom. They wanted better education. It's a, it's a rough, it's a rough go. It's a rough place. If you're a Christian, you're just not treated well. The Israelis aren't going to treat you well and the Muslims aren't going to treat you well. And so, you know, if, if you can go somewhere else, people do, it's what happens. Um, but I also say that there have been, I, I, I get asked regularly, Luke, hey, uh, is, there, is there a trusted address for sending money to help people in Gaza or help uh, the Palestinians in this moment? And I, I have some names, and I pass those along. Munther isn't one of them, but I do. And they, and, the, and they are helping, and Christians are helping. They're helping both Jews and Arabs. That's, that's the thing. Like There's Christians uh, who are supporting both. I'm supporting both. There is a challenge within the Christian world. It's like where you're expected to love the Arab and hate the Jew or love the Jew and hate the Arab. That's not, we're not allowed to do that as Christians. We're not. Okay. Uh, it doesn't mean I have to, you know, support everything that either side's doing either. Right. I don't do that for anybody. So I, I you know, there's a lot of support going ahead and heading into Palestinian territories by Christians. There really is uh, lots of money. We're very troubled, we're very sad by all of this. And again, we continue to plead for the opportunity to be heard. We continue uh, to plead uh, with these evangelical leaders, come and listen and talk and see things with your own eyes. Uh, take our perspective seriously. Tucker, you mentioned something important about the war in Iraq and that war literally emptied half of the Christian population there. Uh, you know that Christian leaders pleaded with the American administration not to do that war and not to engage in it. And because we realize, they realize that uh, it's going to have some serious consequences, not just on the Christian presence, but on the region as a whole. And never, I think, did they anticipate that it will have this severe impact on the Christian presence in the Middle East. 
So again, I wish these leaders realize how damaging their position, their lobbying, their money is, even to our Again, uh, to the position in Iraq. So, yeah, America was, um, uh, we were there, and it, and it caused a lot of problems, for sure. Nobody's going to deny that. And at the same time, I think that, you know, we got to be clear as to why they were driven out. They weren't driven out by American soldiers. They were driven out by Islamists who equated Christians to America, unfortunately, and said, you're gone like just made life really hard for them stole their land killed their property killed their people killed you know stole their wives and children and you know it was just it was bad it was bad 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 and uh but it wasn't it wasn't yeah i'm mean, like america kind of made it open to happen but we didn't cause it okay uh and the decline was coming anyways right it just it, like with the exception of of israel um, nowhere else in the Middle East is a Christian church growing. Um, not not the historic church. Now you got places like Iran where, like through evangelism, uh, there's there's a growing church, but it was because it was zero, right, or super almost zero. But it's it's uh yeah, there's there's more Iraqi Christians in the suburbs of Chicago than are left in Iraq. Just keep that in mind as Palestinian Christians and as Middle Eastern Christians uh, in general. It, it's very obvious to me that many evangelical leaders in the United States care much more about the highly secular government of Israel than they care about Christian communities in the Middle East. Why do you, do you have a guess as to why that would be? Some of it is theology. Some of it is the theology of Christian Zionism uh, that teaches, uh, for example, uh, that Christians must support Israel because the Bible teaches that. And um, oftentimes that is part of a larger uh, theology of the end times in which they view the presence of uh, Jews in the land as preparing for the second coming of Christ. They see it as a fulfillment of prophecy, uh, not realizing again what that means on the ground. I always say it's as if the land was empty to them. Uh, they are excited about certain events without understanding the consequences of these events on real uh, lives. Uh, the so there is this uh, kind of, you know, whole thing with, you know, was the, was the land empty, right? I mean, I mean, it wasn't obviously empty, empty, but you have to admit it was, it was actually at the time when the Jews started coming back to the land, there was not a ton of people. Right, Jews started coming back. I mean, Jews were coming back to land for a long time. They, there was a big move in the 1880s. Uh, there was a there was a messianic movement that the Messiah was coming. Uh, that was that had picked up in Yemen. So a bunch of Yemenites came in the 1880s. People started coming around the turn of the century. Um, you know, but when when Mark Twain, Samuel Clements went. Uh, he, he wrote a book called Innocence Abroad. He's just traveling the region or whatever. And he says this about Jerusalem. He says this is uh, 18, 1867. He said, Palestine is desolate and unlovely. And why should it be otherwise? Can't the curse of deity beautify a land? Palestine is no more than this works day world. And it's sacred to poetry and tradition. It's a dreamland, right? So, just dreary and desolate. It really is like the whole this whole describe as he's walking through there uh, is wow. This place is really small. This is not what I thought it was going to look like. Um, and and so it was it was pretty empty actually. Um, and as Jews started moving back, uh, actually because they were so successful in their farming that that actually Arabs started moving to to Israel. Um, you know, if you look at pictures from the turn of the century or even from the like 2020 of like Jerusalem and the Temple Mount and et cetera, like, no, it was pretty empty. It's not uh, like you just you're denying history if you think it was just like stuffed the gills with all these like Palestinians, Christians and Arabs and Muslims. Irony is that many of these positions actually believe uh, and many evangelical leaders believe that at the end times and after Jews are gathered in Palestine, two-thirds of them will be massacred. 
uh, and only for the other third to convert to Christianity. And somehow they consider that uh, a Jewish friendly uh, theology. Um, don't get me wrong, I am for Christians and Jews, just like I'm for all religions coming together, understanding one another. All right, that, that got away from me a little bit, but his little whole spiel on the end times, I'm sorry. That's, I mean, there are some Christians, yes, who have that view of the end times, but it is not the majority. It's not. It's, uh, yeah, it's it, like the support for Israel is, in a large sense is not based upon the end times. It's for a variety of reasons. My own personal view on support for Israel is not based on the end times. It's not. It's just not. So, and I'm I'm not an outlier. I'm I'm pretty normal. But there is something very problematic when we make a certain religious group as an object in our theology and even uh, eschatology and relate to them uh, accordingly. Again, without really understanding what is happening uh, on the ground, uh, without understanding uh, even the complexity of Israel as a state, how secular it is, but even uh, how much. Uh, it is oppressing Palestinians, uh, breaking the international law, committing uh, sometimes, you know, human rights abusing documented against uh, Palestinians, including Palestinian uh, Christians. Uh, to me, Christians should be for peace. And uh, again, uh, I wish you were investing all of this energy and money in initiatives that uh, bring peace, uh, not continuing to support Israel unconditionally without holding them accountable, which is, in my opinion, what drove us to this mess right now with the catastrophe of thousands of Palestinians killed and October 7 and all of that. Uh, it's all of these policies. And uh, we continue to say that the church has been part of the problem. And it's one of my desires to see the church part of the solution when it comes to Palestine and Israel. Whether in this war or before, it was confirmed to me that the church is part of the problem. Let me let me pick up on on his his kind of claim that the church is a problem. I I don't deny that. I just think the church is a problem is 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 uh, it's it's misapplied here. I mean, the fact is that for most of the last two thousand years, the church was against Jews, like wholesale like all across the world against jews and it wasn't until maybe a hundred years ago that that began to change it really wasn't i would say that even after the holocaust if there wasn't in israel christians would still be like uh whatever like israel made a huge difference in the minds of christians how they view the jewish people and israel's not that old Right, so the church has been a problem for most of its existence in its relation to the Jews, and the problem is, is that the Palestinian Christians, instead of doing evangelism to other Muslims, because there, I mean, there are some that are doing that, and they do it. I mean, honestly, if you if you're doing evangelism to Muslims and you're Palestinian Christian, like, I don't really care what you think about Israel. Honestly, I don't, because you're doing the hard work, the hard work that nobody, hardly anybody's doing. But if you're if you're just kind of like, you know, being the spokesperson for the Islamists, like you're not, you're and, and you're a church leader, you're also not helping, right? Because what 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 kind of witness are you being, right? Like honestly, what kind of witness are you being, Mother? What kind? It would be pretty easy for Republicans in the U.S. Congress to say we support the government of Israel, but if you touch a single Christian harm a single church, prevent any Christian from practicing his religion, you're done. Not a single dollar uh, will come from the U.S. Congress for you. Um, that doesn't seem hard. I, I have to ask specifically about the church in Gaza that was damaged in an airstrike. Who did that? And wh what do we know about that? So there were several incidents uh, when it comes to the Christian community in Gaza. Uh, and first, let's just explain that the majority of them live at the heart of Gaza and in Gaza City itself. And uh, since the war broke, uh, they all chose to uh, hide and take refuge in the two major churches, the Orthodox and the Catholic. There's also a small Baptist church, which was also damaged by the bombing, by the way, but uh, nobody was hiding there. 
And uh, they chose to be there thinking that we don't want to become refugees in the South with the unknown facing us. Uh, we don't want to leave. Many of them are uh, descendants of 1948 crisis, the Nakba. Uh, so many of them are descendants of refugees. So they thought we don't want to go through the same again. One of them told me if I'm going to die, I'd rather die in the church. Um, they thought the church was safe. But the church was not. So uh, I think 10 days after the war or so, uh, the Orthodox Church was hit or was uh, impacted by an Israeli missile. And uh, 18 people were killed, including nine children, uh, Palestinian Christians, nine Palestinian Christian children, 18 altogether. Uh, as I said, including uh, relatives of uh, church members. Uh, who were devastated by uh, the impact by we were all devastated uh, by that because uh, honestly we thought the church was safe and so there's more to the story than this right uh there was an initial report uh that, you know that the, the israeli hit the church itself they targeted the church uh because at the time like israel was not dropping like dummy bombs there was like intention like targeted and the building next to where the church was was actually being used to launch rockets to Israel. And at that time, there were literally hundreds of rockets every day being launched to Israel. On the initial, you know, barrage, 4,000, 4, more than 4,000 were launched, and just so many rockets were going out, right? Like there were rockets being launched to Israel every day for the first three months of this war, guys. And it, and the, like, and they were using, Hamas was using schools, hospitals, mosques, setting up, guess where? Next to a church, right? So when, when Israel responds, it hits the building next to where the, where, the, where the church was and next to where in the church grounds the people were staying. Now that, that building that was hit fell over, right? It fell over and it, and it landed on the building and it and it crushed the building and and yes 18 people died uh but it it wasn't intentional uh that wasn't the church itself was not targeted what was targeted was the building next to the church that was used uh to launch rockets at hamas now let me just say again to the issue of complicity if somebody is doing an act of evil in your like somebody's building a bomb in your living room and you don't report them, you're complicit. If somebody is 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 launching rockets at civilians, it's like that's an act of evil. And if you're Christians and you're just like, oh, okay, it's like this next door, it's okay. No, it's not okay. But you know, obviously, it's it's understanding why people don't react to it or, or respond to it because that could cost them their lives. And people are like, I don't want to die for that, and so they don't. But they also, uh, like, it's, it's these rockets were coming out of everywhere in Gaza. And it, it, it's, 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 it's a real tragedy. And there was so much media about this, so many stories. But he doesn't think so, as he's about to tell you. And, and to be clear, it's a building in the church compound that they were taking refuge in. It's a, it's a small uh, um, uh, campus. And the, church, the, the building that was his is directly close uh, to a historical church building. The church itself dates back to the 4th and 5th century, and uh, it fell on the church itself. Um, it, things could have been worse if, uh, you know, it did not fall on the, the, the building that was struck did not fall on the historic church. So this was a, a major incident. Uh, and actually, Tucker, I followed, even the Christian media did not cover it. Many Christians. That's, that part's not true. I mean, the reality is, Munther doesn't follow Christian media in America. If he did, he would know that, like, it was a big story. Charlie Kirk, who is uh, Tucker's friend, he talked about it. Uh, the former congressman, uh, Joe Amash, he had family members, uh, Gazan family members, who were killed. That in and of itself got a ton of, of media play, not only in like secular media, but in Christian media as well. We reached out ourselves as Fields Project to, you know, find out what happened. Can we be of help in any way? It was it was a well covered story, but Munther doesn't know. Christian media outlets did not give it uh, uh, you know uh, 
and and this shows that American Christian support to Christians is actually conditioned by where you stand on the political spectrum. Um, it's it's not as if so if. Uh, if Christians were hit or targeted or persecuted by someone who's not an ally, then the, you will see an outrage. But because Israel is an ally to, to America, no one cares about uh, Christians being targeted. In fact, in the Catholic Church, two elderly women were killed by snipers, by Israeli snipers. Uh, and the Catholic Church talked about it. Uh, there were statements, official statements from the Patriarch saying that it was Israeli snipers who killed the two women in the vicinity of the church, in front of the church. They were leaving the church to go from one building to... So here's another uh, situation that, you know, is lost in the fog of war. You know, we, we you know, reached out to our contacts. Basically, the report came back uh, that Israel was not right there in that area, but they also couldn't confirm that it was not them. It doesn't surprise me at all that the you know, Latin patriarchate and the clergy, you know, said it was Israel, but I'm suspicious of that. You know, if it, if it was Israel, it was wrong, but if it was Hamas, it wouldn't surprise me, right? Because this is a great story for them, right? If they can, if they can shoot some Christians and then Israel gets the blame for it, that's a big win for them. It is. But the other, they would kill Chuck. And when people tried to rescue them, they were also shot at and seven were uh, wounded. Uh, this happened again. And you, how, how can this be a mistake, Tucker? That's our question, because they were in the middle uh, of the church. And, and to Agree. How can it be a mistake? Maybe it wasn't Israeli. Maybe it was Hamas. But that's one of the words you don't use in this whole interview. One word. No Hamas anywhere. It's as if, you know, it's everybody's just kind of, you know, Israel's just out there just shooting people. It's weird. Come on. Use, like, at least acknowledge the evil that's being done in, in Gaza. Back to all of this already tragic situation, uh, those people in Gaza we talked to, um, almost all of them told us that their homes have been already been destroyed by the bombing, by the Israeli bombings. So now, if they survive this war, and it's a big if, we hope they do, uh, there, there's nowhere left for them to go. Uh, where will they end? I mean, they're begging us, can you get us out? Uh, of course, we're helpless here. What can we do other than pray and try to send some uh, financial support to them so that they can uh, pay f uh, uh, buy food? And right now, uh, they're telling us their biggest problem is starvation. They're literally starving. Um, and many of them uh, died for lack of medical uh, care. So in Gaza right now, if you get sick, chances are very high you can survive it because there is no medicine, no medical care, especially among uh, the elderly. Uh, and so around four or five uh, of our Palestinian Christian community inside the church died because of sickness. Uh, most likely because there is no medical attention or uh, medicine whatsoever. You can go to a hospital. Uh, it's literally hell on earth for them right now, uh, even for those hiding uh, inside uh, the two churches. So uh, there, he sell, sold something true and something false. Like starvation is not the, the big issue. Like I, I have... Good intel that the Christians are not starving to death. Starvation is not the thing that they are worried about. There are people who have, who are in or have died. Either they didn't have medicine that they normally took. You know, their health deteriorated. Uh, they were old. Lots of that kind of thing happened. And the blame on all of this, any innocent person who dies in Gaza is there. It, they die because of Hamas. If October had October seventh hadn't happened, none of this would be happening. None of the Christians would be worried about, you know, their medicine or their food, whatever. All the blame needs to go to Hamas. And Tucker and Munther need to acknowledge that. I, I'm confused. Why wouldn't Christians in Gaza, cowering in their church and dying of curable illnesses, be allowed to travel into Israel? Why wouldn't they be allowed to leave? Why would they be held there? I mean, they're Christians. They're not a threat this is the, to anyone. No, no, but this is the nature of the siege. The siege has been there for 
since 2007. It's collective punishment against all Palestinians. I think this is one of the misconceptions that uh, Israel uh, as if favors Christians uh, against Muslims. No. It's not a siege. It's not a siege. If it is a siege, it's the worst siege in history, right? The siege where a siege is where you like, you know, surround the castle walls and don't let food and water in and, and, Eventually, the, the government falls and they, they admit and they become part of the kingdom. That's not, that's not what happened in here, right? There, are, there, is, there is a border in Gaza. There's a border, it borders the Mediterranean Sea. It borders on the north Israel. It borders on the, on the east Israel. And on the south, it borders Egypt, right? So if there's a siege, it's a siege by Egypt too. It's a siege by Egypt too. So add that to it, or don't say it, it's a siege. Israel looks at us as, uh, as Palestinians. Um, and um, I want to draw attention to, you know, even two years ago in the West Bank, when uh, Palestinian Christian journalist Shirin Abu Akla, who's also an American citizen, uh, was shot dead uh, by Israeli forces, uh, and no one was held uh, accountable. So Palestinian Christians suffer from everything under this brutal occupation whether in Gaza, which is more difficult than here in the West Bank. But even here at the West Bank, uh, we uh, go through everything from land confiscation to the restrictions. Uh, and so that Christian community in Gaza right now is, is stuck uh, inside. Uh, you know, um, they can't leave. Uh, no one can leave Gaza right now unless, uh, you know, you have some sort of arrangement with the Egyptian government in Rafah. But as I said, the majority of Christians uh, have decided to stay in the city uh, of Gaza. So, th so this goes back to the fragmentation I mentioned. Remember, I said we have relatives of our church members in Gaza. Well, that you know they haven't seen each other for a while now because uh, you need a permit from the Israeli military, even as a Christian, to travel from one place to the other. Tucker, we're talking I'm talking to you from Bethlehem, and Jerusalem is literally 15 minutes away from here. I can walk to Jerusalem in 30 minutes. Uh, I can be at, uh, at the old city of Jerusalem in probably 40 minutes walk. I can get there, even as a clergy. I don't have a permit, and I need a permit that uh, we get from the Israeli military as Palestinians uh, to go from one place to the other. So for me as a clergy from Bethlehem, I cannot even go to Jerusalem. This is our reality today. As a minister, so it, it's just hard to believe we would send any money to a government that would do something like that to Christians. So let me just ask, having been to Bethlehem, I was <clears throat> surprised by how hard it was to get there and surprised, honestly, by how shabby it was. And I was surprised because I think millions of Christian pilgrims from the West go there every year because, of course, that's the birthplace of Christ and the Church of the Nativity is there. So why isn't Bethlehem the recipient of aid from Christian groups in the West or more aid, enough aid? Uh, we do receive some aid, but it's not enough. And by the way, it's nothing in comparison to the aid Israel receives. That's, that's the uh, interesting part in all of this. And I, I would love to reach a point in which we don't actually need any aid. If Bethlehem was open to the world, uh, we can flourish as a community, uh, not just from uh, tourism and obviously the pilgrimage, um, the Palestinian people are very creative, uh, very, uh, uh, you know, talented. We can do much if we have the opportunity to flourish as, uh, as a community. Um, but, but you does something important because we as Palestinian Christians, I think, rely. I, I do. I do love how Tucker is like, I've been to Bethlehem. It's a little, it's a little shabby. It's a little, it's, a, it's not the cleanest place in the whole wide world. Right. And, uh, you know, Munther's argument, well, you know, we'd, we'd be great if it wasn't for the occupation. Um, well, there's lots of places in the Middle East. Go check them out and see if they're, they're you know, that don't have occupation. See how they're doing. And before COVID, uh, we had record numbers of uh, pilgrims staying in Bethlehem. The economy was, uh, you know, especially in Bethlehem, was really going up. But then COVID hit us. And now this war hit us, and uh, I'm not sure we're, you know, it's going to be very uh, easy for us uh, to survive. Uh, 
And when it comes to support, um, not just I wish to reach the point where we don't need support because Bethlehem is open to the world. Uh, I want to emphasize that the biggest support right now we, that we're asking for is not financial, but on, on uh, uh, political advocacy for peace uh, and for a solution, whether it be uh, a two-state solution or any other solution. We will not survive as a Christian community if uh, the situation of Palestinians in general is not solved. Honestly, there he's he's not wrong. I mean, the Christian community is is quickly dwindling. It is. It's dropping really fast. I mean, even the official numbers coming out of the Palestinian Authority, I don't think are realistic. I don't think they're accurate. Um, I talked to a a, a tour guide uh, last year when he was when I asked him like, you know, what wh you know, where's the where's the Christians? He's like, yeah, so many have left. You know, COVID was was a huge issue for for it, and then, and then secondly, it was the not just COVID, but the war. I mean, right now you cannot get into into Bethlehem, uh, like you can't drive into Bethlehem right now, um, and it, it has a real impact on the community for sure. And since the creation of Israel, we've been in uh, under uh, the occupation under different. Uh, you know, phases of that occupation. And uh, the current status quo, as this Gaza war has proven, is not sustainable at all. Uh, and we've warned about this, by the way. I meet with church leaders all the time, and I've always said the current status quo that Israel has created, a status quo, by the way, that many human rights organizations have described using the word apartheid, is not sustainable. It's going to lead to violence, ultimately. It's going to explode. I've never in my wildest dream uh, thought it's going to be as deadly and violent as we're witnessing right now. And my fear is that if we don't do anything about the West Bank, my biggest nightmare is that something similar will happen uh, in the West Bank. So what we're calling for is reasonable, fair-minded uh, uh, Christian leaders who understand the reality on the ground and are able to lobby for a just peace in this land where uh, Palestinians and Israelis live together. Right now, as I said. Well, I think everybody wants that, right? Everybody wants some kind of peace where 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 Jews and, and, and Arabs can live together. The challenge is that so much of the trust was destroyed on October 7th, right? Like it's no like, you know, I've been I've been describing to people that the situation went from a low trust environment, which means that like you know there was there was like uh, people were it's it's not we don't we're not friends, we're we're not really enemies. We're just kind of in that middle. We don't we don't, we're just let's each each to his own, and let's you know like I, I need money, you need money. We got families, you got families. Let's let's whatever, right. And it went from that to a no trust world, right? There's no trust between uh, Jews and Arabs. And it's because of October 7th. You know, the people that were working in the, you know, as, as gardeners and housekeepers and were helping out in the Kafaraza and, and Niroz and, and some of these kibbutzes that were attacked first. And they had maps. Uh, Hamas had maps of where, you know, where the the leader of the community was, and where the guy who's the security officer, where's he at, and et cetera. And so you can imagine that, you know, nobody's no, the Jews are not super ready to say, yeah, hey, come on in and and let's do this again. It's it's a it's a no trust world, and it's a, I do think people want to figure out a way, but it's not going to be easy, and it's going to take a while. Um, and I, you know, the, the solution, if you, if there is one, um, is, is, is a ways away. I look at the church and I see it only as part of the problem, advocating for one side on account of the other. Of course, there are many who understand and who visit, but by and large, look at the bigger picture in terms of political lobbying, uh, in terms of, uh, financial support, uh, I don't think it's it's helping us as Palestinian Christians, and and this, by the way, doesn't um, 
is that about one political party or the other? Uh, I remember even during the Trump administration, we pleaded as a Christian community, we pleaded that uh, moving the embassy doesn't help. Uh, we pleaded that a peace treaty with other Arab countries, as much as I want to see peace, if you don't start with the Palestinians, it's not going to help. Uh, but again, it seems our perspective is never taken serious. Yeah, because your perspective is wrong, Monther, right? Like the fact that Israel is able to make peace with 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 the Arab nations that were that were previously enemies of theirs, like Morocco, Sudan. Bahrain, UAE, like it's it's really that's quite something. The issue with with so many of the the Palestinian leadership here is that it's the, the, like a lot of people moved on. They moved on, man. Uh, they're not into like for so many years. It's like look at us, look at us. We're here. We take us seriously, and they see and and everybody took them seriously. Okay, what do you got? And it's like, well, did you suck? Well, okay, that's not enough, right? Like, it's, you got to have something else to offer, and they and they don't. Rarely they do, and if it is, it's like, you know, it's really got some some spikes on it. Israel is is very often described in American media as the only democracy in the region. Democracy, of course, suggests religious freedom, pluralism. How free are Christians to practice Christianity in Israel? We cannot deny that there are many freedoms in, in, in the state of Israel. Yes. Uh, but it's not uh, as free as people think. And let me give you an example. And I know that this might come across as shocking to many. Do you know that evangelicals as churches are not officially recognized in Israel? The, not recognized uh, by the government and by of Israel? The way, by the government of Israel. Even oh. Yeah. Uh which it's true. It's true. Uh mind you, it's also true that the evangelical churches in the in the West Bank are also not recognized in Palestinian territories, Palestinian areas where governed by the Palestinian Authority, the evangelicals are also not recognized. Um, it actually has a lot to do with it's like, you know, one of those areas. Well, oh my gosh, I can't believe what, right? Because you're thinking like an American, right? But you, what you don't understand is that things like marrying and burying are handled by religious authorities in, in Israel and in the Palestinian Authority. Okay. Which means if you are a member of the the Roman Catholic Church, or the Greek Orthodox Church, or the Lutheran Church, or the Anglican Church, then you can have your, you know, your marriage and your burying recognized, right? There's a spot for it. And it comes down to the fact that those are the legacy denominations in the region, right? And the, and the evangelicals are like, you know, we we're like all over the place. You know, there's Baptists and there's non-denom and there's all that. You know, it's like we're the evangelicals are a hot mess and there's no like one leader. And and plus they're all new in the in the grand scheme of things in the region, right? So that you get this like it's yeah, it's not recognized. Now, years ago, we worked on a, actually a project uh, to get the evangelical churches in in the Palestinian territories recognized. Uh, we went and met with leaders of the, like we met with Saeed Berka, who was the leader of the Palestinian, one of the leaders of the Palestinians at the time. And he's like, yeah, let me, you know, uh, we'll get on it. The, the, you know, lawyers are working on it right now. And come on, it didn't happen. Uh, and it didn't happen in Israel either uh, because, you know, the, the churches, they, like they're, they're not opening up recognition uh, just to anybody. Uh, in Israel, across in like across the board, so it's it's uh, seen as a as an insult here, but it's seen as insult because of pure ignorance. And uh, Monther is taking advantage of Tucker's ignorance, or or his like, oh my gosh, I can't believe it. Uh, but it's 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 not it's not what you think, guys. Evangelism is illegal in Israel. And uh, all right, it's not. 
It's not. Evangelism is not illegal in Israel. Okay, guys? It's not. All right, what's illegal? You can't evangelize kids. Okay, anybody under 18, you can't. And you can't offer something in exchange for conversion. Okay, so you can't like walk around, hey, I'll give you a TV if you convert to Jesus. Right? Like you can't do that. Why would you want to do that anyways? That's not how it works. It's not how conversion works. It's like faith and the Holy Spirit's involved. You get a TV. Jeez. So it's not illegal. Actually, he admits it here coming up. Wait, I'm sorry. Well, may, I ask you just, may I ask you to stop there? What does that mean, evangelism is illegal in Israel? It's it's against the law to evangelize in Israel and to, to cr proselytize, Christian, as they call it. Christian evangelizing is illegal in Israel? It's not. Oh, my gosh. It's not. The conversion. Uh, and so if you are a Jewish person and you convert to Christianity, you will, you will go through many legal uh, challenges to recognize your uh, uh, marriage certificate, um, to recognize a lot of your uh, rights. Because again, uh, evangelical Christianity is not officially recognized as a denomination in the state of Israel. Uh, many uh, Israeli politicians try to pass laws that prevent Christians from sharing their, uh, their uh, faith. Uh, and so there is always this struggle and this. All right. He's not wrong there. It's, it is hard. If you, if you uh, become a follower of Jesus in, in Israel, you know, go from a Jewish person to a follower of Jesus, it is, it is hard. But you know where it's harder? Guess where? Under the Palestinian Authority, right? Because in the Palestinian Authority, let me, let me read to you uh, from Article 4 of the Basic Laws of Palestine, which is like the uh, Constitution, if you will, right? It says, Islam is the official religion of Palestine. Uh, respect for the sanctity of, of all other divine religions shall be maintained. So it's all right. Like it's, you know, you can stay where you're at. Okay. Uh, the principles of Islamic Sharia law shall be the principles of source of legislation. Arabic shall be the official language. All right. That's basic law number four in the Palestinian Authority. And it's like, you can, you can be a, you can be what you were basically, but don't change. Okay. So freedom conscious, not real in Palestinian Authority, but you know, Munter doesn't, you know, this is all, this is all a chance for uh, Tucker and Munter to go, you know, go all hot and bothered against Israel. So here it is. Tension about how much can Christians express their faith. Now, the biggest problem Christians are facing is in East Jerusalem, where they are constantly targeted by radical groups, radical Jewish groups. Let's be clear. Uh, sometimes some churches, uh, they tried, uh, there was an attempt to burn them. Um, oftentimes, and this is, you, you can look at it on social media uh, all over the place, uh, Palestinian, uh, uh, Christian clergy being spit at by uh, these groups. Uh, they write very offensive slogans on the wall. There's strong incitements against Christians, especially in the old city uh, of, of Jerusalem. So what, 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 what kind of slogans? Many... I'm sorry to ask you to pause. What kind of slogans, what kind of graffiti is written against Christians? Uh, in we don't want Christians get out of here. Some of, some of it is very, very offensive, actually, that I can say. A lot of it is calling for Christians, uh, whether Christians or Armenian Christians. It's a small Christian community, part of the Christian community in East Jerusalem. Uh, we don't want you here. You should leave. Uh, so there are all these incitements against Christians, especially in, uh, in Jerusalem. And uh, one might say that when we expect to see radical groups in every uh, faith tradition. And I say, of course, yes, that exists. The problem is when they go unchecked and they're never held accountable, even when there are arsons, I mean, attacks on churches, oftentimes the complaint of the heads of churches in Jerusalem, the Catholics, the Orthodox, the Protestant, is that it seems that those who do these attacks are never held accountable. In fact, I think it was around two years ago when the heads of churches said in a statement uh, that they feel there is a systematic attempt to empty Jerusalem of Christians. I mean, these are strong words. 
Uh, look at that statement from the heads of churches. Uh, so the impression that it's flowery here for uh, for Christians. So you know there is a there has been an issue in in Jerusalem of you know Jews spitting on clergy, and uh, not only has the 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 religious leadership of Israel spoken out against it, like the the leaders of the of the Orthodox community all the way down have have spoken out against it. Uh, the municipality of Jerusalem has spoken about against it. Uh, those who were responsible for the arsons were they were held accountable. I mean, that, like it that 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 stuff happens. Um, you know, there's always some there's there's a there's some fringe elements, uh, but they they are not elevated. Nobody's passing out candy when they do something. It's a it's a it's a they are held accountable. And the community is is very much against it. Um, I, I've spoken to a lot of of Israelis uh, who are appalled by that kind of activity, and those in the religious Zionist community who are very very much against it. Uh, you know, so it it is there is accountability. Is 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 definitely not true. But beyond that, we have to look at the wider political. Uh, spectrum because at the end of the day Israel wants to be both democratic and Jewish a and many question whether that is uh, possible uh, and that's why as I said even Israeli human rights organization have called out the policies and discrimination uh, policies of Israel um, the nation state law for example states this is a, a law that was pa passed by the Knesset it states that the right for self-determination in the state of Israel is exclusive to the Jewish people only so this is a law that was passed by the Knesset that it doesn't say that it doesn't it's, it's more complex it's, it's it's broader than that it is I mean it, it did listen there was a it was an attempt uh, there was this whole move. Monter was part of it to to create this one state, one binational state, um, in which the goal was, hey, we'll we'll out then outbreed the the Jews and we'll take over. Like there was that. Like I was at a conference, actually, mind you, I was at Monter's conference, sitting across from a woman who said to me, uh, you know, I'm a, I'm I'm into the one state, and you know why? Because we will have our, we'll have more babies and then we'll take over the Knesset. And you know what we'll do? We'll drive them out. We'll drive out the Jews. That's what she said to me. Uh, makes Jews superior in the state of Israel because they are the only one they are. They have exclusively the right for self-determination. Uh, so whether it's on incitement against Christians in Jerusalem, whether it's in the fact that not all Christian churches are recognized, or whether it's uh, the structure of the state of Israel uh, uh, as a whole, uh, many have pointed uh, that it's not really fully as flowery as people think, where there is just full freedom, uh, especially freedom of, uh, of religion. Um, and even in this war, we've seen uh, academics targeted, we've seen uh, uh social media being monitored by the israeli government against israeli citizenship what you can say and what you cannot say and uh if you say anything you know just that uh for example you uh, uh what happened on october 7th you could be put in jail i mean i i i'm not saying i support what happened in october 7th i'm saying that even israel now is targeting and monitoring the social media and many of the palestinian citizens of israel because many people forget that 20 percent of the citizens of israel are actually palestinians 20 percent uh or so uh so they're afraid to even speak out uh, and say anything even that sounds uh, uh that has sympathy with the people of Gaza because they feel now i i don't know whether israel is monitoring or not the social media of palestinians but it wouldn't have Arabs in their midst, but it wouldn't surprise me, right? Because the, it's like, again, like the people who, I mean, the people around in the kibbutzes around Gaza, those were the peaceniks of Israel. Those were the ones who were the most willing to, you know, 
welcome the Palestinians into like, let's, let's, let's work together. Let's have peace. Let's build the community together. You know, the, one of the one, one of the women from Kafaraza would fly a kite over Gaza every Saturday that said like peace and love and like, you know, all that sort of stuff. She did. And, and it's like that, that was what was destroyed that whole like movement. And in the same time, you have a, the support in the polling data of October 7th that the Palestinian Authority has not denounced. None of the leadership of the Palestinian Authority has denounced October 7th. Keep that in mind when people are like, oh, but the Palestinian Authority, they're the good guys. They have not denounced it. I Like maybe, I, I don't know, maybe you haven't seen the videos. Maybe you haven't seen some of the brutality of what was committed against the Jews on October 7th. It was brutal. It's seared in my mind. I have in my mind a picture of a a, a father, the, well, the, the, the black charred remains of a father holding his arms like this. He was cradling his baby. And his baby isn't there. And he's charred. That's seared in my mind. And why, like, for, for what? Because he was Jewish. He was a Jewish guy on the peace side. He wasn't like the, you know, the rabble-rousing, you know, uh, guys who are, uh, you know, taking up taking up residence and so on, right? Like, they, it's, they went after the peacenecks, guys. They went after the peacenecks. They will be targeted or they might lose uh, their jobs. Um, again, I invite people to come and listen to stories and understand what's happening. Talk to church leaders. Talk to church leaders in Jerusalem about the challenges and difficulties uh, they are facing uh, right now before the war or during the war uh, in Jerusalem. So the Speaker of the House in, uh, in the United States, third in line to the president, third most powerful person in our political structure, is a self-described evangelical Christian and a, a supporter of the government of Israel. And I, I would be interested in asking him what he thinks of the fact that Israelis who convert to Christianity have fewer rights. I don't know if he knows that. But he has said that he supports Israel for theological reasons, the ones that you described, that Christians have a moral duty to support the government of Israel um, because Scripture tells them so. Is there any place in the older New Testaments that suggests or commands Christians to support the go the modern government, the secular government of Israel. Where does that come from? I haven't read that. But the problem is when you equate the modern secular state of Israel with the Israel of the Bible. The Israel of the Bible was a faith community in a covenant relationship with God uh, that was given the laws and asked to be a light to the nations. And uh, through that nation, we as Christians believe Jesus uh, came as a savior uh, to the world. The problem begins when you compare or when you uh, equate the modern secular state of Israel, a political entity birthed in the 20th century, with the people of Israel uh, in the Bible. And this takes the question, uh, which is... Now, the question you might have is, should Christians support Israel? That's a good question to have. And I would say that the answer is yes. I'm with I'm with Speaker Johnson on that. Um, and I I I think uh, you know, Munther should spend a bit more time. Romans eleven. Okay. Got my Bible here, pulling up Romans eleven. Get my glasses on because I can't see anything, right? And and the, he, Paul says in Romans eleven, um that he's talking about He's talking about Israel, literally talking about Israel, okay? And he's talking about, as you know, it's, he, he, this whole section here, but I'm just going to drop this verse in here. Um, he says, as regard to the Gospels, they're enemies of God for your sake, your sake being the Gentiles. That's you, Munther, and Tucker, and me, okay? Like, um, but as regard to election, they are beloved for the sake of their forefathers. So they're in the election. Okay. That's what that says. 
and for the gifts and callings of God are not irrevocable. Not irrevocable. So they, they still stand, and they're still for them, and it still matters to them. They're still part. They're still special. God has a plan for them. And I think Christians have been taught to read the Bible through Gentile eyes because we're mostly Gentiles. And once you begin to read it through the eyes of the people who wrote it, which were all Jewish, hopefully it will change you. It changed me. It's a theological question of the chosen people uh, into something that I call the chosen state. Uh, the Bible doesn't talk about a chosen state. And uh, to me, the biggest problem, again, is when we give special treatment to any people group, give privileges to any people group, uh, Tucker, I'm a theologian, and to me, the idea of chosenness is never about entitlement. Chosenness is about responsibility. It's about our calling to be a light, to be a, uh, a blessing to others. We cannot change that into a theology of entitlement. And definitely, a state cannot take that and make it uh, the blueprint for being entitled and asking for everyone uh, as if to support them. And the problem here is that it's not like, uh, you know, uh, uh, it's, it's, it's the Christians who are saying this. It's the Christian pastors who are saying we are called to bless Israel. Because when you mentioned Mike Johnson, he said uh, when he became house speaker that as Christians, the Bible tells us we should support Israel. Um, and I ask, what about the context? What if, hypothetically speaking, let's not get into our argument, what if Israel is committing uh, uh, war crimes? Or what if Israel is breaking the international law? Does that mean as Christians we should support them regardless? Um, and I guess, I mean, I, I could channel Speaker Johnson right here and say, he would be like, no, no, it doesn't mean that. Like support doesn't mean like support without any objection at all under any, you know, like it's not like, a, like nobody does that for anything. Nobody supports their own country a hundred, a hundred percent. Like, you know, their own country can do no wrong. I don't think I'm under no false pretenses that America can do no wrong or that Israel can do no wrong. And if they were committing war crimes, I hope they'd be accountable, right? That would be my expectation. And I expect that Speaker Johnson would think, think the same thing. But listen, the Bible divides the world into two people, two, the Jews, and then everybody else, okay? And either you are in the category of the Jews or you are in the category of everybody else. And God has a plan for both. He does. But it was through the Jews. And at the end of the book, Munther, at the end of the book, in the, the New Jerusalem, the 12 gates are for the 12 tribes. And I fully understand and I'm fully aware of the shameful history of Christianity in particular when it comes to anti-Semitism. Uh, but the solution to anti-Semitism cannot be a blank support to Zionism, uh, especially since that support to Zionism has come on the expense of uh, Palestinians. I always say it seems to me that many Christians in the West are repenting uh, over the sin of anti-Semitism, a sin that happened on their ground. They are repenting on uh, our ground. So uh, to answer your question, no, I don't think the Bible justifies or calls for an unconditional support to a political entity. I think the Bible calls us to be good. Agreed. We agree on that. Nobody's saying that. Nobody. Neighbors to all people, Jews, Muslims, Buddhists, atheists. I think the Bible calls us to love all people. Yeah, it does. It also calls on you to love the Jews. It does. It calls on that. So please start. You know, quit quit being the spokesperson for Hamas. It's not it's not a good look, dude. And to show uh, no favoritism, because God shows no favoritism.
It's in the Bible. Um, and the way many of these Christians talk about Israel actually uh, makes puts us immediately as Middle Eastern Christians uh, in the defense position. You know, I pastor the Evangelical Lutheran Christmas Church in Bethlehem. I have the word evangelical at the title of my church. And every time an evangelical church leader says something that uh, implies uh, unconditional support to Israel, people ask, is this what you stand for? And, and we always say, no, they don't represent us. And when this support translates into support of war, this is where I'm troubled the most. It's not just because I'm a Palestinian, by the way. Uh, as a Christian, I'm troubled because it's the credibility of the Christian witness uh, that is at stake when it seems that Christians, as in the example of Warburg, uh, seems to uh, call for the genocide of two million Palestinians in Gaza, throw a nuclear bomb and get rid of them. I mean, is that really the way of Christ? Uh, is this uh, how we walk in Jesus' footsteps as Jesus' followers. So we're pleading. Uh... Now let me say here, so that nobody is confused by what I think. I, I, I agree that we need to figure out a way for the Palestinians to thrive as a people. They do. I think it's important that Hamas is defeated and Hamas is not their leader. And they're, they're rather than being educated to hate, they're educated to respect their neighbor. Um, that's my hope. Okay, no, I'm not. I'm not going to call for genocide. Not like you know, none of that. None of that. Nobody, nobody putting that on us over here at the Fields Project. We're not calling for that. We are calling for a defeat of Hamas. That's what we're calling for. For a, uh, a different not just position, but for, for, for a dialogue. We're pleading even, please reconsider. Uh, and I'm not exaggerating when we use strong words like, they need to repent uh, of these uh, ways. If, if you wake up in the morning and decide that your Christian faith requires you to support a foreign government blowing up churches and killing Christians, I, I think you've lost the thread. It, it, just to, to end on this, if you... This is this is an appalling statement by Tucker. I mean, I agree. If you're call, if you're if you're supporting a foreign government doing that, yeah, yeah, of course. But that's not what's happening. And it's not it's not just like like to put it so flippantly as if it's like it's just in the other government. Here's the thing: is that I actually think Israel is unique in all the governments of the world, all the peoples of the world all the places of the world. Israel is unique. And you know what makes me think that? My Bible. Now, you can say, Luke, well, I don't believe the Bible. Well, it's like, okay, then that's a different, we'll have a different kind of argument, a different dis or discussion, whatever it is that we're going to have. And I, I will enjoy it greatly with you. But what the basis for my thinking is, and like, you know, I, I you know, Isaiah 2 talks about the nations will go up to the mount uh, to, to they will go up to the mountain of the Lord and hear from the God of Jacob. The word will go forth. The, no, sorry. The law will go forth from Zion. The word of the Lord to the ends of the earth, and then it goes in. And God will judge between nations, and then they will turn their swords into plushes and the spears into pruning hooks. Right? Like there's a. It's almost like there is this this progression of understanding of God's plan for the world leads to less war. That's how I interpret that. And what that's what I think is unique about Israel and the Jewish people is that God gave them the blueprint for how we flourish as a people, as humans. And then our goal is to then take that to, to the ends of the earth and actually see that manifested. And I think, like Christians, we get to pick up that mantle as well, right? But it is unique, and it's not just supporting some like, like I'm, I'm not. This isn't about like the Netanyahu government, right? Like, will I support the government of Israel? Yes, but like, is it the the, the Kud government or the government that was before that one? Or the but like, okay, like it's. I mean, and 
I'm also not like the supporting the like tax policy. Uh, what do I think about their healthcare system? You know, are they legalizing marijuana? Like, like I don't care about any of that stuff, really. I mean, it's that's not what I mean when I'm supporting Israel. What I'm supporting, what I mean by I'm supporting Israel, I'm supporting the essence of Israel as part of God's plan for this earth, for the redemption of the world. That's what I'm supporting. And the current form is a democracy. And people are wrestling with who's their leader. And like, okay, whatever. You guys do it. You pick that. Because like, when you like read the book of Kings and Chronicles, like there was kings that use like, oh yeah, they were around for 50 years, whatever. Okay, like, dude, 50 years. <laughs> like we're like, I can't believe that Yahoo has been in government for you know uh, so long, and and like there was a king for fifty years, and he he got a he got a, like a paragraph, okay. Like think of it in terms of this like there's a grand plan going on, meta narrative, a big story, and like be part of it by being supportive of the Israel and the Jewish people. That's what I'm saying. I had a message for Christian leaders in the United States, whether in government or in churches or just citizens who care about the religion and their fellow Christians, what would it be? It would be to remind them that when the state of Israel was created, it was not created on an empty land. It was created on a land that had uh, millions of indigenous Palestinians there, including Palestinian Christians. And that that state they support, uh, that state they celebrated as a fulfillment of prophecy and a sign of God's state to the Jewish people for it to become a state uh, hundreds of thousands of Palestinians, including Palestinian Christians, uh, were forced to leave and have never returned. Uh, churches were closed. A friend of mine did the research and counted more than 30 churches that were closed when Israel was created because Palestinians uh, were expelled from uh, the land. Our numbers continue to be in decline. Uh, so we're pleading that uh, come and listen, come and talk to us. And my message to Christian leaders right now is there is a very, very brutal war taking place in Gaza, a war that I have described using the word genocide because it's a war that has used even starvation as a mean. And fellow Christians are suffering because of that war. Uh, it's time that uh, Christian leaders uh, recognize that wars is not the way, whether in Iraq and Afghanistan and Libya, and, I mean, when will we learn that war? Yeah. Who started this war? Who started this war, Monther? What are they named? What is the organization? It's Hamas. I mean, like, it, it, like it's all it takes is to name them. And, and you won't right here. And I don't know why. Well, I mean, I, I kind of know. Because you're afraid. Like, you, you, like you, you can't go against the people who control you which is the Islamists at this point. And it's sad uh, because it's, this is like what, it, what you're doing out there is the same thing that so many Christians in the region are doing, have done is it just got, it got easier to obey the master than to evangelize him. And the church is dying. The church is dying. And there, I mean, there's there's a lot of Christians who are who are like they have Christians in their name, like they're Christian, like this is their identity. But they're they're atheists. They they're part of Marxist terrorist organizations. It's it's it, there's there's so much more. There's so much more that could have or could have and could be. But it October seventh. What like it? It didn't come out of nowhere. It was chosen for a day in which Hamas decided to carry out the brutal attack against the Jewish people, and the consequences of that is that Israel responded, and the consequences of that is, as expected, the world can't see. They, they, in the mind of the world, the Jews can't win, right? So the Jews can't win, and. But in the mind of Christians, hopefully, and in the mind of God, the Jews will win. They always do. Because they're around, and they're not going anywhere. It's not hell. When will we take Jesus' words seriously? 
uh, about being peacemakers, about being merciful. Merciful. There must be uh, other ways. Uh, and so it would be an invitation to listen, to learn more, uh, and to avoid very shallow and simplistic perspectives that are not based on scripture itself, but more based on uh, political uh, equations. Uh, and I would plead right now, and I will continue to plead that we need to stop this war in Gaza. Uh, it's killing many, many children, women, innocent lives. It has to stop. There must be uh, other ways. And as a follower of Christ, uh, we have to pursue the path of peace uh, and justice, and we have to avoid simplistic uh, polarizations, good and evil. Come and listen, come and understand what's happening. And I plead as a Christian pastor from Bethlehem, I plead that you come uh, and listen. Well, I've come many times, Mother. I've come and listened. I brought my groups to meet you. And uh, yeah, it like, Dude, you're offering nothing that is different than what so many of the other anti anti Israeli the 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 Jew haters are offering. It is like if if your message is the message of Jesus, Jesus was a Jew. It was it would, like you know your your message of like Jesus, baby Jesus in the rubble was to take away the 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 Jewishness of Jesus and turn him into, you know, Jesus, the Palestinian, the Palestinian baby in the rubble. Like you, you're, you're turn everything around, man. And it's, it's tragic that to me, that, that, uh, that Tucker, uh, you know, in all the, the Christians of Israel in the West bank, or Judea and Samaria, whatever you call it, all the Christians that they found you because there's a bunch of Christians there who love both their Jewish neighbor and their Arab neighbor. There's, there's churches that are, that have, that are full of all the peoples of the land, but that's not what you get here. And so I do agree. Blessed are the peacemaker. Blessed are those who will show mercy. I, I like, I, I want nothing more than, than for Jews and Arabs to live side by side in peace. I want nothing more than that. But that's not what we're going to get by the stuff that you're advocating for. Because it's, it's not as you say. It's not. It's, it is, sure, it's not simplistic. But in some ways, it's not really super complicated either. There was an evil on October 7th. And this war could end when Hamas lays down its weapons and releases the hostages. That The war would end. But Hamas won't do that. They said they won't do it. So this is where we're at. Father, thank you for your thoroughly decent and sensible analysis, and I hope it's heard by Christians throughout the West. I appreciate it. Tucker, um, let me put this here, uh, that I want to take you fishing on the Sea of Galley because that would be fun. And I know you like it. I like fishing too. And uh, I can show you around, show you the, let you see another part of this country, another way, another group. Let me introduce you to to other other Christians, if that's if that's what you if, if that's what you're trying to get at here, because um, you got one perspective, you do you got one perspective, but it's it's slowly becoming not not a main one, and there are lots of there's lots of other perspectives, and so I I hope that you will consider a different path, right? Uh, I don't need more. Also, I don't need more anti-semites on the right so don't don't go there either because i i, I kind of like you i think you i think you do good stuff sometimes so all right that is all i'm done i'm done with my uh you know uh, check out what's going on video and uh thanks for tuning in who made it those who made it full length uh i appreciate you sticking around 
I had fun. And uh, who knows? Maybe we'll do more of these as uh, things unfold from here. Uh, there, there seems to be a a bubbling of uh, people on the right uh, who need a little bit of confrontation. So we'll do that as well as people on the left who need a little challenge. And so uh, these reaction videos, uh, hope you enjoyed it. Uh, I did. And uh, hopefully it won't be the last one. And thanks for tuning in. Uh, be sure to uh, like, subscribe, do all the things you're supposed to do when, when, uh, when you're on socials. Okay. Thanks everybody. Have a good one. I'm Luke Moon. Bye.